for those guys who are back and sitting in the room and trying to relax, um, if you want to, if, I, if you want me to say something, one question that's my, boggling m many project managers and managers as such, this is a question for managers, that means. You guys need to do research on, and we all need to do research on how pyramids were constructed. If you were a project manager, do you know how to plan to construct a pyramid? Think about that. It's, sorry? Yeah, 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 the pyramid, yeah, yeah. The Egyptian pyramid, yes. No, no LDA. No, no. I don't respect LDA anymore. I don't care. No, it's an old technology. Yeah, yeah. It's at least three, four years old. If you take a couple of GPUs, let's say four or five GPUs, it takes two to three weeks, depending upon how complex the model is, for a translation or summarization. Uh, people are trying to cut down the amount of data set so that they can do it in a day or two because four, two, three weeks, even if you have four, five, or 10 GPUs, it's just not possible because you can't train, you can't go back and modify and check uh, uh, all of that stuff. Uh, yeah. So that, that's an approximate uh, size. A million data points, inputs with five to 10 GPUs takes two to three weeks. And so when you say size the point like the million sentences? Sentences, sentences, yeah. In French, yeah, yeah, for example. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it will be even more, depending upon what's the stack, how many layers you have stacked, uh, all of the stuff, too, even what is the drop-off rate, and all, so many different factors there, yeah. Yeah. Right now, all production uh, systems for translation by any of the big companies are all deep, deep models only. They, the published reports, they use a, something score called blue score and rogue scores. Um, then 50 or 60 percent is, is the highest number I've seen uh, being accurate um, uh, in translation and summarization. Summarization is even more difficult. I'll talk about that because uh, you can have, if, see, if it's a translation, there is a right way of translating and a wrong way of translating. That's period. You know that very well. But summarization, you could do a different way and I could do it differently and both are right. So that's where I think the blue scores are being used in rogue score. But in translation, uh, I think 50, 60 percent is what the accuracy rates are. So if you use a Google translator, I think uh, I've seen when I go to Brazil, uh, my Brazilian friends with Portuguese, and they'll be smiling and laughing because I think when I say in something in English, I don't know whether it's doing correct or not, but obviously it's doing something else. You can, if, if, you, if the model is, can I just predict what language it is, or oh, that's even a simpler problem. That's a simpler problem. You can just feed a bunch of sentences and say this is, this, you just give a class name called la language, and then with a few, maybe 10,000, 100,000 sentences, it'll figure out what language it is. That's easier. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 you don't even need to. Let's say you have trained a model which will do English to French, let's say, but you're giving in German. It'll tell you oh, this is not even English, so I'm not even, it'll not do anything there. Okay. Yeah, it'll figure out if this is not English. Well, that model I've not seen, multiple to multiple I've not seen. One to multiple I've seen, I, I just showed you a slide. So from English to so many different languages you can do. So you give a one English language sentence, it does simultaneously to all other four languages. But it, any language you give to any language, I don't think there is a model, at I don't know, I'm not sure. I've not heard of transfer learnings in uh, NLP. I've seen more of the image processing. Yeah. Yes, uh, in a couple of days, I'm actually going to have the video and the slides together available. Yeah, I think maybe an email will be sent to all the attendees, but I'll be posting on my LinkedIn too. So my LinkedIn is, uh, I'll actually put, uh, I have a YouTube channel, so I'll put it in the gym channel and then link it from my uh, LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. There are a couple of advantages of CNNs. For example, you can do uh, parallel. You can parallelize a lot of training if you're doing CNNs. Number one. 
uh, RNNs and LSTMs are sequential. But uh, even though there are only a couple of papers which have used CNNs to do processing text, 90%, 95% of the papers are using only LSTMs or RNN variations for text processing. People don't use CNNs. There are some papers used, but I would do, if I would do, I will do an RNN or an LSTM or a GRU, but not CNN. Mm -hmm. Forget about the multiple languages. There are a fewer models available from English to Chinese because of the way the language, Chinese language is structured compared to an English center. Uh, you need to have a lot more data set, and they're not able to create so much of a data set in this point of time. There are a couple of papers published, but I think the accuracy rates are so low because they don't have enough data set for that. But they have tried to prove the concept, yes, it can work for any language, so you can take an English to, let's say, even Arabic or even French, uh, Arabic and Chinese and Japanese because they're all differently structured languages compared to English. Yeah, yeah. There are papers available, yeah. When you're training a model, you have to be a big company or a big organization. You, individuals cannot do it, because you and me, if you have just a regular I, uh, laptop or a desktop, it takes just one compilation or one training will take, let's say, two to three weeks or four weeks. And if you want to make a minor correction, it'll take another four weeks, and it's, it's going to, you'll get bored, really. Um, if, if you're an organization, what they do is, uh, it takes still two to three weeks for a training, and uh, that's why they're trying to see if we can reduce the number of parameters and reduce the computation time, even sacrificing the quality. That's why you don't see models increasing the accuracy rates faster, because it takes, unless you come out of the newer techniques, with the existing techniques, it takes more and more time. And people just don't have time. Like, for example, if you are a researcher, PhD guy, you've got to publish at least 20 papers in five years so that you can get out of your PhD. And you don't have time months after months to do that. Same in the case of organizations. So they have quarterly results. They can't wait for two years to actually do one research. No, those are two different things. You actually have a one model trained, and you put it in the production. You can continue training with the other model. Oh, people are doing it all the time. So you, they train it for, uh, let's say, six weeks, take it out and put it in production, and then continue with the training again. We have more data coming in, they start training it. After six weeks, they'd stop it, take the state, whatever it is, take. Well, they are updating. I'm just predicting, I'm just randomly saying number six weeks. It could be every week, too. But you don't have, if you have to add some data and retrain a model, unless you're doing a reinforcement learning, which I don't know how they do it, I'm sure that you can, um, uh, transfer learning, sorry. Uh, it, maybe you can just take maybe another extra one week, but if you're doing, uh, retraining the entire model, starting from scratch, it's going to take six weeks plus another week. Yeah. They won't give. That's the money. They're actually paying money to actually get that. So what they're doing is they're actually hiring companies like uh, Crowdflower is one data creation company. Crowdflower, Mechanical Turk, another company called Amazon Company. They're actually creating data sets. So you pay a lot of money. You go to cheaper countries, uh, or rather countries where the resources are available freely and more cheaper, let's say Philippines, Vietnam, India, China, and there are people sitting there in offices and they're trying to translate or annotating. They're actually, let's say if it's a contract management software, someone is sitting and say, looking at the sentence, ah, this one is a termination clause. This is non-compete clause. This is uh, whatever clause, the identifying clauses people sitting together down on human beings and creating data sets. Then you can. So if whoever is doing it, that's their money. That's why if you want to start a company, that's where the money is too, creating data sets. There's lots of rules in, rules you need to write. You have a bunch of big rule engineers to write. Number one, for example, if you see a problem, a lot of people are using shortcuts. That's not an NLP problem. It's a pure software problem. Figure out what the shortcuts are, have a dictionary, and then update, modify it. Number two, if people are using abbreviations and stuff, that's another dictionary problem. So you just write a rule engine there. But once you eliminate the unknowns, the abbreviations, shortcuts, and all the things, now we have a full text. Now, then use the NLP on top to extract the meaning of that. Extracting meaning is a big problem. A lot of people at the company are trying to figure out intent, extracting intent from a sentence. Like, for example, if, someone, if, if a contract says, in a clause says, the supplier will pay a penalty of 5% if the, the quality of the production 
in this one year is worse than 10 percent, let's say. You have so much of information that one sentence, unless a human being sits down, you can't understand. But you are, are trying to defend models, how to understand that complete sentence and identify actionable. I talked about sentence chunking and segmentations of sentences. It actually picks sensible sentences. If the supplier has, the supplier will pay a penalty. You just pick up that and say, okay, there is a potential possibility of supplier paying to the penalty. So look at the other chunk. As I say, it says, if the quality is less than 10%, pay a penalty of $10, whatever. So you pick up that and say, okay, let's see, can I write a rule engine which will connect with this and this, but there's a lot of software there. There's so many companies working on that, no one has figured out it. It depends. If it's an academic world, yes, people have to publish how good the model is because otherwise no one knows what it is. But if it's a company, if you're screwed if, if it's inaccurate. If it's a legal or a regulated industry, you are stuck. If it's a non-regulated industry, people want to bring it up as high quality as possible. People like you and me will be posting on Facebook and LinkedIn and sort of how bad the model is and uh, that itself is a good indicator of how bad uh, accuracy. There are, no, there are no tools available. Uh, so for example, translation, there's a rogue score or a, and a blue score for translation. Well, the translation is, if you want to, f let's say I give you a paragraph and your model does a translation. And then you ask a third person to do a translation too. So you have model created translation and a human created translation. How do you find out which one is better? People are saying, okay, if there are single words, bigrams and trigrams, matching words available, the more number of words in a machine translated are available compared to a human translated, that means the machine translated is closer to the human translated, and hence it's better. So for mathematical purposes, they're com comparing how many trigrams in a machine language, machine translated model matches with the human translated. If you have 30 out of 300 are matching, that's my accuracy. But if I have only 300 bi bigrams in my intro translated, all of them match with the human translated, that is 100 or 300 bigrams with 300 bigrams in that. So it's 100% accuracy. That's another problem too. Yeah, that's another problem too. So they're trying to do it. They'll use two different human beings and say compare between the two. But they need to have human, a human being a standard person. Actually, yeah, in GRE and GMAT exams, I'm told uh, um, when you write the essay as a test, the model actually is doing an analysis how good the model is, how good the essay is, and giving a score. So what they do is they randomly pick once in a while and give it to a human being. And then, without telling what the score was, and they're comparing constantly to see whether the model is still intelligent or not. <coughs> Apparently, it was good. It's still going on fine. So there is model is improving, but anyway, we need to get back, and then 12.30, I want to stop. Yeah. OK, gentlemen, ladies, uh, let's start. Uh, Summarization. I will not talk about uh, the question answering. When you create a neural network to do a translation, uh, sorry, summarization, you give uh, a larger text and it outputs a shorter text. If you take that approach to the extreme, it can also be used for topic modeling. Let's say you have an article, you are a news reporter or a news reporting organization and you just got a write-up from a, a person who talks about uh, the scandals going on in football and uh, money laundering and, and Las Vegas casinos. Do you want to connect that with a casino or a scandal or, a, or Las Vegas or a sport? It could be any type, it can fit into any topic. So topic modeling, to identify what topic this fits into, would be another variation of summarization, but if you just want to create a summary of a larger text, you can use neural networks too. The, the biggest difference of some, uh, uh, summarization compared to translation is, there is a right translation, there's a wrong translation, period. So you know what was the right thing and the wrong thing. If the model makes a mistake, you say that's a mistake. But in translation, unless the model makes a tremendously wrong translation, wrong words, unk words, gibberish words, then you can say it's a bad sum, uh, summarization. But summarization per se itself is so human specific. The way I would summarize a large text would be different from the way you would do and you would do and other people do. 
So comparing how good a model was when you do a summarization was, is, is always a difficult task and how to compare how good the model is. And even getting, when you, for training purposes too, for you to create a corpora or a training data set of variety of summarizations, it's not easy. So we'll talk about that. So again, you will use a sequence to sequence model here too. And you will even use a bidirectional sequence to sequence. Again, the advantage of a bidirectional compared to a unidirectional is you, the unidirectional only knows what was the inputs in the past, whereas in bidirectional, it also knows what was the inputs in the future. So this is the paper uh, published by the gentleman I mentioned to you earlier, Richard Socher, and a few other guys, I think they did it in 2016, I guess. So it's not too long ago. Which year are we in? 2017, so it's less than a year ago. Uh, this paper was published and um, in addition to using just a regular sequence to sequence or bidirectional sequence to sequence model, they've actually implemented a few techniques which actually uh, improved the summarization uh, uh, um, outcomes a lot. So as of today, I think, uh, so he's part of Salesforce, so I guess the Salesforce summarization model is the best model as far as I know unless something has happened in the last uh, uh, 10 hours, uh, I would not know. So uh, in, a, in a very simple language, if you look into a summarization, you have an encoder and a decoder, you have a, a series of uh, inputs coming into encoder, it's a bidirectional uh, LSTM or a GRU, and the last hidden state is given to a decoder uh, LSTM, and this is not, a, obviously it doesn't make sense to have a bidirectional here because there's no, you don't know what the future is because you're doing a, uh, and then you start outputting and then figure out, uh, train the model in the process, like a typical sequence to sequence or, or encoder decoder model. But here what they've done is, in addition to having, um, they implemented attention, but they implemented an entirely new technique, which is what I want to really highlight. Uh, there is something called reinforcement learning. What's reinforcement learning? Um, this approach is used for uh, in robotics and uh, games and defining and uh, training uh, neural networks to play games. So let me give an example in the context of a uh, game. Let's say you play a chess game, a game of chess. Yeah, two players play. Let's say the game is actually being played between two international grandmasters. Grandmasters, yeah? You, you're aware of the term, grandmasters? And grandmasters are extremely talented people. They know how to play chess. But when two grandmasters play, one person wins, one person loses, right? Is the losing grandmaster any bad player? He or she is an extremely intelligent and smart player. But based on a series of steps, even though at any point the step was the right step to take, among all the op uh, steps you can take, you pick a step and then you move that. But over a period of let's say 10, 20, 15 moves, you figure out one series of moves was the right thing to do and one series of moves was the wrong thing to do, right? So how would you train a model in such an instance where you don't know what is right or wrong at every step, but you know at the end of the series of steps? It's called reinforcement learning. So you have a, uh, uh, the concept is you have a state, what state the, the, the game is in, you have an action, the agent takes an action, and you have a rewarding policy. The model, you will tell the model whether this was the right thing, this is the wrong thing, but you are telling this after a series of actions you have taken. Long story short, reinforcement learning is if you don't know the Raw, right or wrong answer after every step, but you can only know at the end of 10 steps, you, you train the model by telling at the end of the 10 steps. So they've used the same approach here. So in addition to the regular training of a summarization technique where you have a, a large text and some human being has created a shorter text, which is summarized text, they train the model first, they input the large text, 
And when the model is outputting, the decoder is outputting the summarized text, you compare word by word to tell the model whether it's right or wrong. That's the traditional approach, which we've already seen. On top of this, they said, okay, we are going to use reinforcement learning where we will put the entire summarized, human summarized version as an input. So you give the large text, let model summarize the entire text. At the end of the entire summarization, you tell whether that was the right thing or the wrong thing compared to the human created summary. So it's like instead of waiting for word by word accuracy prediction or correction, you're actually going for the entire summarization done. So that's the, uh, the, um, the picture there, the, the circular picture there, the reinforcement learning. Uh, how they did it, I think you've got to read the paper, but the overall concept is in addition to the encoder decoder, in addition to attention model, they, uh, and in addition to use, using bidirectional encoder technique here, they also used a reinforcement learning to enhance the accuracy of summarization. So let me show the picture in a different way. Also, when they did the regular training, you have the attention. The attention is a, till now if you paid attention, attention is always on the encoder side. Because the decoding, the decoder will go look into the encoder for seventh word and the tenth word. So you're actually paying attention on the encoder side. But here they actually introduce an attention to the decoder too. And this was primarily to avoid repetition of words. In other words, when it goes back and checks itself what it has produced as a summary, it will also figure out, hang on, I've already converted that, I've already summarized that message or I've already used that message in, in summarization, so I should not go there. So if you look into the, the, the context vector, you have the context vector of the encoder, you have the context vector of the decoder, and you have the current context vector of uh, the decoder. I'll show it on this side too. So you have the context vector of the encoder, and you have the context vector of the decoder, and uh, let me see what the alphabet is. H, H is the current uh, context vector um, of uh, the decoder at that timestamp T. And based on all these three hidden vectors or hidden, uh, hidden uh, uh, vectors, the model makes a prediction on what the right word is on the entire vocab. If you have 50,000 words, it actually makes a prediction. So instead of just using only one, it, it does uh, all the three context vectors. So that's one idea when you're making a summarization model. So you use the same techniques, which I taught you earlier in the morning, like you have the sequence to sequence, encoder, attention, and you can use bidirectional, you can use uh, uh, attention for the decoder, all of those ideas. This is another improvement on top of uh, the previous one. People, if you, if you look into human beings, when you do a summarization, you actually don't read only once, you actually read twice to summarize, at least for me. I need to read uh, anything, everything two times. So if you look into the model, it reads the entire text once, and when it's reading the entire text the second time, it actually takes the hidden state of the first encoder. So you have encoder one and encoder two. Encoder one talks about first reading, and encoder two is the second reading, and of course you have the decoder. That's the overall structure, but let me explain how the model works. Okay, so after the encoder one is done, all that you're taking from encoder one is just the hidden state. So in the detail explanation here, let's not show the encoder one. So you have the encoder two, hidden state that's coming out, encoder two, this is hidden state at first time step of encoder two. The number two of the superscript is, is referring to the number of uh, the deco encoder. So you have encoder, to taking in the information. At, at every time step, it is using that information to compute a overall context vector, which will be used by the decoder to make a prediction. 
but uh, while doing it, it also wants to go back and look at a factor of the hidden state. It's called pointer. This is called pointer networks, P1, P2, P3. These are various pointers trying to point to the words in the, in the input text. So there's the encoder text, which will decide, the model will decide based on the training, if I know the word to summarize, I will pick up the word from my decoder vocab, I will pick it up and put it there. If I don't find the right word in my decoder vocab, I'm actually going to look into the encoder vocab, which is, I know the entire context because the large text, I'm going to pick the word from there and when to pick, when not to pick is the training of this pointer. So pointers will tell, will give a factor of when to pick and when not to pick and when to pick, you actually identify which word to pick from. To, to summarize in this case, the, the improvement from the previous paper is you read not once, but you read twice. Now you can say, can I read third time? I'm sure you can, but there's no paper published on that. So you can read the second time. After you read the second time, you pass on the hidden state and start making predictions. But in the process of making predictions, you also need to figure out if you don't have the right word in your decoder vocab, you should also have the option of picking the word from the encoder vocab. So when to copy from the encoder versus how, when to pick from the decoder is a pointer mechanism. So it, this, is, this concept is called pointer mechanism, which is being implemented. This is part of the training. Similar to the attention training where you, you will let the hidden states, uh, uh, when you're training, you can find the scalar number which multiplies each of the hidden state and uh, tells the model and model over, over a period of time figures out which, uh, which word to focus or the attention mechanism in the, which area to focus on the inputs. The similar is that even the pointer mechanism too, it, the model figures out where to pick the word from and at what time to pick the word from the encoder, uh, encoder uh, vocab compared to the decoder vocab. That's the read again and copy model which was published I think again in 2016 if I remember correctly, yeah. Um, or maybe 2017. The, okay, here is the complicated uh, picture. Take a second to read it. At least look at just the top left uh, picture. Look at the number of arrows. So here is the encoder one. So you give a time step t, you give the first input, and you initialize the encoder to the hidden state being zeros at the starting point. And at the end of the first input, there is a hidden state called h11, yeah, h11. The subscript a one is to refer to the time step one, and superscript one refers to the encoder one. And so you do the entire training first for the encoder. Even though in the picture it looks like you will, you're doing simultaneously, you got to do all of these, the entire encoder one training and you store the hidden states for every time step. So when you start training this encoder two, you again initialize the hidden state of encoder two with zeros, you give the input x1, you give the hidden state at time step one from encoder one as another input. You also give the last hidden state at the end of the sentence of hidden state uh, of, of encoder one as an input here. So this last dotted arrow that's going in is the sentence hidden state. That is at the end of a sentence, you have a new hidden state that goes into. So there's so much of information. You are getting not just the current word, you are getting the hidden state of the current word for the previous encoder. You are getting the last hidden state, in other words, the end, center, end, end of sentence hidden state for the first sentence from encoder one. All of these inputs are going in. But here is the the best complicated part, I think it is in the next picture, I think. Uh, let me complicate it a little more. No, it's right here itself. So look at the next picture now on the right bottom. So it's the same picture, but a little more expanded because you have a global uh, uh, 
hidden state two. So look at here, at time step one, it has the initial state, initial uh, hidden state initialized to zero. You have H1 coming in. You have the hidden state at time step from uh, encoder one. You have the sentence end encoder coming in from encoder one. You are also getting a global, you see H global here. That is the hidden state of the entire, after the, of encoder one, of the entire text. So you have the, from encoder one, you have the word hidden state, sentence hidden state, are the entire text hidden state, all of those coming in to process. So these are the two spectacular papers I've seen in summarization. But if you see the fundamental concepts are almost the same. You have the encoder decoder, you have attention on the encoder, attention on the decoder, you have bidirectionality, uh, you're using pointers, you're trying to, in this place, you're using reread. Uh, and in places where you have unks, whether summarization or translation, you try to go back and pick some words from your input uh, source and you can, uh, um, uh, you can also split the input words if you don't find the right word, split the words and take a smaller piece of the input word to see if you can do a translation or as is copy onto the output. So these are the six or seven techniques almost used in almost every other situation. So if you go back and read papers or if you run some of the um, um, model avail model, uh, models available, I think you'll, you'll be able to enjoy that. But I want to actually run, I, I know I have question answering, but I want to run this um, uh, hands-on uh, thing called generating text. I mentioned this to you earlier in the Shakespeare example where you can train a model uh, which, will, uh, which will generate a text. So I've created two LSTM models. I've shared both the files. One is called generate text and there's another one called generate text large LSTM, I think is the name of the file. And both the files have already trained long back. Each, each one takes, I think one took uh, how many, 30 hours something and the second one took around 60 hours. Yeah, to, to train. So I've already trained the model and I've given you the weights. So if you, the, all the information is in, in the directory, I'll show you the files. I can't increase the size of this. Uh, you see the weights improvement 15. This is the, uh, I think 15th epoch, I think I picked. Uh, 1.5805 is the error rate and this is for the bigger uh, LSTM and the, the one below is the smaller LSTM. You can see on your file too, the weights improvement 19 uh, hyphen 1.945. 1.945 is the error rate after the 19th epoch, that's for a smaller one. So if I run the model now, I'll show you, it generates text right in front of you. Uh, let me, uh, again I open it. I say okay. I open the file called uh, generate text. So this is uh, the from a, so I'm training a model based on the story Alice in the, in, the, in the Wonderland. I'm actually training the model. So the model understands how English sentences are created in the book called Alice in the Wonderland. So the whole world, it thinks the whole world is just Alice in the Wonderland. It looks at the text and trains a model. The model is already trained, but when I run it again, what it does is it actually uh, looks for the instance of the model right there and then picks that up and in a few seconds it creates a new text and I want you to see how good or not so good the so it has total characters of 16,000 total vocab 58 uh, with the seed input So she was considering in her own mind as well as she could for the hot day made her feel very, that was the seed input sentence and based on that it's going to create some text. And this is every time it creates different text but. Uh, why is it taking so much time? It should not take so much time. Okay. So let me copy this. So. This is the text it created. Let me copy this and show it to you on a bigger screen. Um. A 
of course, it's gibberish. But it has, it is trying to understand. See, there's a word called U, Y O U, D H E, uh, A and D. It it figured out, I think, a few words, but it is still learning. But this is a smaller model, which which I did not give enough um, LSTM capability to actually process the whole stuff. And also, I did not let it train for longer epochs. The one is only, I think. Uh, uh, 10 or 15 epochs, and the other one, the other one is, is a longer epoch. So this is the text, it's creating randomly, completely randomly. If I run the model again, it'll create some other text, but that's based on just that one uh, text called, uh, the story called Alice in Wonderland. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to run the, the other file, which is actually the bigger file. That's not this. The seed I'm giving her is she thought rightly too, the very few little girls of her age knew the meaning of it all. So I'm just picking randomly 100 characters and then giving that as a seed. So that it will think that's the input and it starts creating based on that text. I was running it on my desktop, so it was taking less time, but I'm, because the laptop, I think, is taking a little longer. In desktop, I have a 32 GB RAM, so it takes maybe two, three seconds, and this one is taking around 10, 15 seconds. When you're using uh, any NLP solutions and you try to define any models for yourself, I think take smaller data sets and small models so that you can actually see the compilation happening, and then, so let me look at this text. This is the, a bigger model. Look at two interesting aspects in this. The, 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 there are not too many errors in the spellings. See, you can see the, let me get my. There's a was, the, door, with, the, doors, I don't know what it is, of, the, te, I don't know, of, the model has become a lot more intelligent. It figured out what's the right way of spelling the words. Of course, there are some uh, random words like duros or whatever. Number one, and even chat and something. But that's one. Second is it's repeating. You can see the door with the door is, door with the door is, door with the door is. So it's, it's repeating. This is one of the biggest problems in any translation or summarization. But in this case, because the model is not uh, industry production level model, that's why I think it's not really up to the mark, but you can run this model when you go home to see how it works. Actually, if you don't use the weights I've given, it'll run at least for, I think, 60 hours, so it'll be running on your desktop. Leave it for a few days and come back, and when it's done, you can, uh, it actually stores the model at every uh, time step. I think it actually creates a copy of it. You all have multiple copies of the model. You can pay, take the model with the lowest uh, uh, inaccuracy rate, and then you can use that for inference. And this is the inference. This is, uh, actually, when I saw it, was, it was, it was it's scary because the model is just on one book with the training of six days on a, uh, on, on a desktop. It's actually creating text, which is similar to a human, human being text. If I do a little more uh, bigger size corpora and do a little more longer training, maybe I can write a nice story of this. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Ajá. Yeah, my plan was not to explain the code, but I can explain to you on, uh, offline. In four hours, this is what my plan was to share. Yeah, no, I cannot. The way it's trained is it is trained on 100 characters. So it actually takes series of 100 characters and creates the next set of 100 characters and based on that it creates another set of 100 characters. So to start that model to start developing some new text, I gave 100 characters. I said, okay, based on this kind of characters, can you start developing? I don't think it makes any difference if I even give, uh, 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 let's say, 100 words or 200 words. I don't think it makes. It only takes the last 100 characters. That's how it has been trained. If I say, okay, based on a seed of I could even train on, based on just the seed of one character, start creating the next characters. The, the, the important aspect is, even if it's 100 characters, the model is trained on characters. So it actually picks what character comes after what and what makes sense and when to put a blank. Uh, so the, the, even though the model ran for six days on, on my computer, but with one corpora of Alice in Wonderland and training that and, and creating human-like language was the amazing part of it. And then, of course, you guys need to yeah. experiment more. And also, this, the, the code, I think, sorry. Um, lot of code is available online. I'm sure you can write this code from scratch. I would never do that. I would just pick up the code existing from GitHub and other places and start modifying it and, 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 and doing it that way. And uh, yeah, that, I think, is making more sense. That's the reason why I think I have this code right there. And maybe that's another reason why I'm not able to explain the whole stuff, because I've not written the code myself. I just picked up the code and then and, and, and start modifying it and, and showing you as an example. Yeah. So is this a public language package? This is, I, th um, I think I mentioned, uh, this, this example is publicly available as a, as a blog written by some gentleman. Let me see, I might have referred it in my, actually it's, it's Yeah, it's in this uh, blog, uh, which is mentioned at the bottom. Yeah, I picked up the quote from there, yeah. By using a language model. Language model actually figures out if some, some word is a correct word or not. And the correct word includes your spelling mistakes and sometimes even the positional position of the word too. If in a sentence, if the word is the wrong position, if it's wrongly spelt, it picks up immediately. So that the solution will be a language model, just using a language model. How can it do it? No, in this model, what I've done is it's actually creating characters. So it's actually trying to learn what characters characters come after what characters, and that is based on the Alice in Wonderland story. So it has it has read the entire entire uh, um, story, uh, maybe a hundred thousand or maybe a million uh, of the characters. It figured out after some time, okay. When a W comes and A comes after that and S comes after that, many times when the W and A, S and S come after that, there should be a blank because that's how the next character is blank. So it figures out over a period of time. But it could still not figure out the doors. It, there was no word, but it, it, it thought that was, a, that was a sequence of seven characters comes one next to each other. After that, a blank comes. So it's not even, it does not even know what it's writing. It's not even, it doesn't make an a understanding sense of the text, but it's just creating the text. The, the, the point I'm trying to make when, when I show this is you can create a model which actually can understand, given a large amount of text, it understands how the text is written. So y using that technique, you can, if you're doing a translation or a uh, spelling correction, topic modeling, question answering, summarization, you can do a little more tweaking and it model will figure out, okay, for such a large text, I need to put output only, let's say, 100 words because that's what I've been trained, and that is nothing else but summarization. But it does not know it's doing summarization. It just thinks, okay, by for that particular model, if you give this much text, it gives this much of text. That's the only thing it can do. Yeah, and it does not know the logic why it's doing it. Yes. For summarization, I don't know, but I don't think so too. You can run AWS too. Yeah, it can. Maybe one hour, 
Yes, and a GPU I think may take quite short time, maybe four or five hours. This took like 60 hours for me on a, on a iMac uh, i7. 20 frames over, like you can bring it down. 10 minutes? Sorry, no, no, it was a joke, okay. Yeah, 10 minutes, I don't know, but yeah, I think it's considerably 10 times, at least 20 times less of time compared to a CPU, yeah. Um, that's all I had to share for today, but if you have any questions, I'll take, and um, we have, have eight more minutes, but. You know, a long time ago, I asked a prof, uh, yes, sir. Uh, kind I address. Uh, off late, people use LSTMs and GRUs, that's it. Not too much of RNNs. And you're doing a text processing. Majority of the times, there are some instances where people are using RNNs. The primary problem of RNN, because of which in text processing people prefer LSTM and GRUs, is vanishing gradients or exploding gradients. In other words, a longer sequence longer than 10 words, an RNN cannot manage. But if you look into carefully an RNN and LSTM and GRU, all are RNNs, all are some variations of recurrent neural networks. LSTM works differently, but it's again another RNN too. In other words, it actually, because it has multiple gates called input, output, forget gates, it knows what information to save and throw away and other stuff. So it, it is efficient in some way. I have not seen a paper, but I'll not be surprised if I see a paper where, you know what, this LSTM which is trying to forget and ignore some data, which actually is creating some inefficiency, I would rather go for a higher capability RNN because it never ignores anything and it's more uh, efficient and intelligent. That may be a possibility, but right now I've not seen a paper like that. So with the, with the industry knowledge today, if you're trying to use a text processing and using a deep networks, use LSTMs. And between LSTMs and GRUs, I've seen lots of papers published where they seem to be almost similar, but LSTM seems to be in some cases better than GRUs too. So of the three variations, if I want to recommend, use LSTMs. What a vector is a technique of creating a vector out of a word. But topic modeling is a training you give to the model. So if you have a corpora of lots of text with topics already modeled, you train the model with that input text and the topic models, and it understands, okay, if this much of text, these are the words you are putting as a topic modeling, then it looks for some understanding from the text and adjusts its weights and eventually, that particular model will only do topic modeling, but it becomes intelligent in topic modeling if you give a large text because you have trained it in that way. Yeah, one more last one. Yeah. Uh, you know, what is the also impact that complete word or text and the Word. No, no, you're not putting stop words, no. You're giving the entire text, yeah. Yes, yes, see, stop word removal, stemming, etc., is used, if you have a text where you're processing, trying to extract information, extract meaning, intent sometimes, you're trying to do that. But if you're, that's not even deep learning, that's not deep learning, that's, that's a regular NLP. But in deep learning, especially for problem areas like summarization, question answering, translation, you use deep learning models where you have to have a input and output data, lots of data sets, and you train the model. That's an entirely different thing. You don't, you don't take out the text at the time. Because the text, the model has to look at some of the stop words too. You can't lem lemmatize and stematize. But when you're doing translation in some situations where it could not find the right word, in place of putting unk, what it does is it picks a word and breaks the word, and in, in that process, you need, you need to lemmatize. Maybe you just need to tokenize. You need to just pick only in character by character. At that time, you may use some of these techniques, that's, but that's a pure software programming activity. Where you just do, invoke an NL, NLTK uh, uh, statement, get the information, pass it on to the model, model looks at it, and then uses it. Yes, sir. Um, do you have a way to, uh, normally it's take a long time to train the, uh, the model, right? Do you have a way to see the progress uh, beside the TensorBoard? Yes. Um, you have a TensorBoard, that's, that's one way of looking at it. 
The second is when you're training the model after each epoch, you can actually write a program in such a way it is it it takes a dump and, and makes a statement to you, okay, I've done with the first epoch, second epoch. It, it can keep the information in form to you. So, uh, and, and also every, after the end of each epoch, you, you normally store the weights, you store the model because many times if something goes wrong with the machine or a power cut or some problem, you don't want the whole thing to be repeated again. So what people do is yeah, at the end of each epoch, you just store uh, the model uh, state at that time and then keep on doing training. Because something goes wrong, then at least you can start from there. So that's the only way you'll figure out what the progress is. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Visualization per se, it's actually a great thing to understand the inner workings of a model. Let's say if you look at a tensor board, it actually tells you how the model is evolving, what the accuracy rates are changing and moving, what may be the reasons, what data is just coming in. It's a good learning tool if you're doing, in, if you're doing research and even production in, in com companies too. Um, I have not used visualization tools as much. It was, uh, I was academically curious, so I did it a few times. But for me, I just, if I've done a good design of the model, I run it and then do something else because the model is training. It's going to take a few days or a few hours and stuff. I don't really care for the visualizations per se. So I'm, I'm not that keen on visualization per se. I don't see any of the benefit except the fact that you can see how it's evolving. But that, that's an interesting aspect. Yeah, of uh, one question for you. You know, I'm confused about epoch and iteration, you know. I mean, in my mind, I somehow understand epoch is a like uh, like unit of time. I'm thinking. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm confused about epoch and iteration. If you could explain that. Yeah. Epoch is one set of training of the entire data set, and you could do that in mini batches. Let's say if you have a million records, if you process the entire million records, you can say you are done with one epoch. But you won't send all the million records in one go. You send in batches of, let's say, 50, 100, whatever numbers. So you have that's called mini batches. You actually send it. So you have 100 mini batches, and after 100 mini batches, you're done with the entire data. That's called an epoch. So each mini batch is an iteration. It's actually, you're doing an iteration of training. It's sending information. It's doing a back propagation, understanding, becoming wiser, waiting for the next input. And if you do an epoch, you've done all the data. It becomes a lot more wiser. It's ready for another round of the same data coming in. Um, I think a lot of people doing the GRU instead of the LSTM. So do you want to comment on that? I have seen the other way around. I've seen a lot of people using LSTMs than GRUs. Uh, in, my, in my at least, uh, I've referred at least some 10, 15 papers here. Almost all of them are LSTMs except the reread model I was talking. They did both LSTM and GRUs. But I, my experience is uh, not many people using GRUs. Um, uh, there, there seem to be an opinion, I don't know if there's a done in a controlled study or not, there's an opinion that GRUs are slightly faster because um, uh, LSTMs has four gates and GRUs has only three gates. So the computation is slightly lesser, 25% lesser. But if you compare the accuracy and the, uh, the computi computing time throughput, I don't think there was a, a, a spectacular difference that people were more gravitating towards GRUs. I would say people, I think, are uh, using LSTMs a lot more, in my opinion, yeah. So you said uh, generally there are 80% here, here. Oh, okay. <laughs> 80% yeah. effort is spending to clean the data. So is okay. there any recommendation to clean up the data or Spend some general rule time. or tools? Um, the tools, techniques are so data dependent, let's say, you are a translation company, you're trying to do a translation, and uh, you're trying to create data sets. First of all, there are open source data sets, you can use that, you can train the model, but you want to really have that edge for your model, so you are getting translations. So what you do is you actually hire a company which will do the translation for you. Depending on how good the company is and what type of translations they're doing it, you get a good data set or a bad data set. So there, whatever quality enhancements you can do by training those translators and getting the right language skills of the people, not just going for a cheaper company, but a good company, all of that stuff would be 
some best practices I can think of when you get a real good data set. But let's say you are having uh, sentiment analysis and for sentiment analysis you want to get the tweets and uh, there are lots of tweets coming in, uh, if, especially if it's a very controversial or a exciting product and the, the amount of tweets coming in is very fast. You have a pipeline that's coming in, you have a Spark Apache maybe, which is, Apache Spark which is, which is taking in, storing it, you're doing processing. How quickly you can process, how efficiently you can process, how much of the data you really want to pay attention to, how much data you want to ignore, how much data is, uh, uh, is correct, uh, you may not know. For example, you may get a tweet which is not relevant to your product, but someone made a, let's say, uh, your company is Tesla. But someone is talking about in academic world, someone is talking about Tesla as an inventor about electricity, nowhere connected to, referring to the company. But that tweet comes into your pipeline, you will still process that uh, uh, tweet too. But if you have such erroneous or noise, more amount of noise, then you have a problem. How would you figure out? In this case, I don't think there is any other way of humanly possible because you have millions of tweets coming in on a daily basis maybe, you, you can't do it. Any, any real-time data, people are not able to figure out how to, do, how to improve the quality of it, especially for sentiment analysis is one thing which data is coming all the time. You just can't store it, do an analysis. But if it's a healthcare solution or a transportation solution or a, a IoT solution where you have lots of sensors sending in data, you can figure out how many sensors are sending correct data. Are they, are they the right sensors? You can have a human being sit down and look at the data. And, and hence, the, the data quality technique will be so data dependent at the time to see what, what situation you are doing. Okay, so it's a very uh, like application or user dependent. It's a lot of many work. It is, yeah. Okay. It okay. is, it is. So uh, I can sit down offline with you to talk about whatever use case you have. I can talk about what are some of the situations you need to pay attention to if it's a healthcare, if it's a transportation, if it's a manufacturing situation or IoT or uh, airlines. Okay. Uh, yeah, there are right. different ways of um, capturing the data. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anything else? Guys, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Um, one more time, I apologize for not giving the instructions to you in time. It's not uh, John Link's problem. It was my problem. I should have sh shared the instructions for installation a uh, lot earlier. And also, apologies for two errors. One is I could not explain the code. I think Jen was asking. And I made an error on the, on the count semantic analysis code. Uh, sorry for that. But otherwise, thank you very much. Thanks.